when we think of unity, we aren't really thinking of it in the right way. When Paul calls the church to be of one mind, he is not encouraging kind of a cookie cutter type of Christianity. Sometimes there can be kind of a subtle and sometimes not so subtle pressure for everyone in a church to be the same. The same ideas, same political persuasion, same attitude towards social issues, same style of dress, same socioeconomic class, same everything. Almost like little robots. It is my pleasure to welcome you this day to worship our God. We are gathered from all corners of our country and around the world this day. So I invite you and I want to remind you that you are welcome here regardless of your age, your economic status, your religious background, your gender, your sexual orientation. Whoever you are, join us this day in worship and I invite you if you have not worshiped with us before, or it is one of the first times that you have, please contact me. I'd love to give you more information about our church. As we begin our service today, I invite you to join me in the call to worship. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of God has risen upon us. For darkness shall cover the earth, a thick darkness over the peoples. But God will rise upon us, and God's glory will appear over us. The light of God is with us. All the nation's leaders will be drawn to the light of God. God's light now dwells with us. Come, worship God, and shine God's light to the world. prepare our hearts for worship as we recite the prayer of preparation and confession. God of light, you brought hope to the world and joy to our lives in Jesus Christ. Yet darkness hovers in many corners and clings to many things. Possessions pile up and block our view of your light and love. Anger and resentment overpower gentle words and knock out the light for others and despair casts a shadow on the hope for light for all of us. God of light, open our eyes, clear our minds, soften our hearts so that we can walk together as children of light. Shine in our midst again and again. In Jesus' name, amen. But we know God's word to be true, and in his word he promises us that if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us for that sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us remember that and let it affect the way we live today. Amen.
humbled for a season to receive a name from the lips of sinners unto whom he came. Faithfully he bore it, spotless to the last, brought it back victorious when from death Will you join me now in a time of prayer? Holy God, we come to you today, whoever we are, wherever we are, wherever we have been, wherever we're going, we come to be with you and to find ourselves in you too. These are trying times in lots of ways. As individuals, some of us are dealing with problems largely of our own making, while others of us are bowed down by circumstances that seem beyond our control. And at the same time, all of us face challenges we have to endure and resolve together as a community. We find ourselves, as the poet Amanda Gorman says, asking, where can we find light in this never-ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade, We've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace. And the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. So merciful God, shine your light upon us by your spirit. Open our hearts to the peace of your presence. Open our minds to your wisdom and truth. Open our eyes to the horizon of your promise in our ears to the persistent call of your love. Loving God, in this era of new beginnings, move us on from the gloomy conflicts and limitations of the past. We've allowed ourselves to get caught up in all sorts of ways of thinking and behaving that haven't brought honor to you. We can think too highly of ourselves and too low about others that we fail to recognize the humanity of our brothers and sisters, especially when we disagree. So bring us back, merciful God. Bring us back to ourselves and at the same time change us. Turn us around so we can live into the stature we share as your beloved children. Let it begin today that in the words of Seamus Heaney, we can live into a time when hope and history rhyme when we can hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge, we can see that further shore is reachable from here and believe in miracle and cures and healing wells. Healing God, in a moment of silence, we pray for all those who need your provision, need your power, need your healing touch in mind, body, or spirit. Living God, we come to you today seeking answers and consolation and guidance. So be with us now. Be with our new president, Joe Biden, and our vice president, Kamala Harris, and with all of our leaders, those of our nation, of our communities, and of our church. And beckon all of us into your presence. Bring light to our path ahead in Jesus Christ who teaches us to pray together with one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this morning we continue our march through the book of Philippians. We uh, will read today from chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Listen to God's word for us today. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same attitude of mind Christ Jesus had, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human being, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray together. God, we pray that this morning you would take these words of Scripture and the meditations of my heart and that you would give us a clear message today on what it means to imitate you in our attitudes, especially in our attitude in the church and how we see the world around us. So speak to us today, we pray in Christ's name, amen. So today is the third message of a series of messages on the book of Philippians. And as I said, uh, I think in the first sermon, this is a very warm letter. This is a letter between a pastor and a church that he loves dearly. It's a letter of encouragement and affirmation. Paul is pleased with the church in Philippi. Of all the churches, he is probably most proud of this one. They are doing well. They are living out God's vision for his church. No big factions. They're on the right, the right track theologically. They love each other. They are even getting what it means to be a church that looks beyond itself. So as churches go, they are doing pretty well. In fact, Paul affirms what God is doing in their lives. He begins with four ifs, but the ifs are really just this rhetorical device. Paul knows that the Philippians have experienced these things. 
He is just reminding them of the good things they have experienced as a community of faith. So really, probably a better way of translating the verses is by substituting the ifs with since. So something like this, since the love and grace of Christ has made a difference in your life, since you have experienced that special fellowship that can only happen through the movement of the Holy Spirit, this fellowship that the Bible calls koinonia, since from that fellowship you've experienced support and encouragement and cared for each other deeply, since you have experienced all these wonderful things, here is what I want you to do now. Paul sees even greater potential in this church. And just like a good coach is always trying to motivate his team to higher levels of excellence, Paul is trying to motivate this church that he loves to go for it as a church, to even more fully live out God's vision for the church. So he lays out a challenge. He says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and mind. In other words, what Paul is saying to them is be united. He is challenging the Philippians to be so united it is though they have one mind, one direction, one purpose. He wants their hearts and their minds to be united. Now I want to pause here for a second because sometimes when we think of unity, we aren't really thinking of it in the right way. When Paul calls the church to be of one mind, he is not encouraging kind of a cookie cutter type of Christianity. Sometimes there can be kind of a subtle and sometimes not so subtle pressure for everyone in a church to be the same. The same ideas, same political persuasion, same attitude towards social issues, same style of dress, same socioeconomic class, same everything. Almost like little robots. And Paul is not suggesting that kind of uniformity here. In fact, in other writings, Paul encourages diversity within the church. And he says there is diversity. And he even says that this diversity is the strength of the church. It will make it stronger. In 1 Corinthians, in other passages, he, he likens the church to the human body, saying, just as the human body is one, it has many different parts, hands and feet and ears, spleens, livers. They all bring something unique to the body. We will have different gifts. We will have different ideas. We will even be very passionate about different things. So Paul is encouraging diversity and unity. Be united. Even though you are diverse, be united in purpose and mission. You know, as I studied this passage this week, I couldn't help but think about President Biden's inaugural speech, a call to unity. And boy, we need unity as a country today, don't we? But I also couldn't help but think of our church. I think Paul could have easily written this to our church. I can imagine him asking the same questions of us. Has God done a good work in your church? Is God moving? Has Christ made a difference in your life? Have you experienced the grace of God, the love of one another? Have you had brothers and sisters who have walked beside you through difficult times of life? Have you been on the receiving end of love and care? And my hunch is that Paul would see our church in maybe a similar way he sees the Philippians church. Our church is doing well as churches go. But I think we still have so much more to experience as a church. God wants to do so much in and through us. You know, I've only been here at PCC for a few weeks, but here's what I've noticed. As churches go, you're a lot like the Philippians. We are a lot like the Philippians. 
we're doing okay. We look at our church and we think, wow, we have great worship, fantastic music. We have, boy, and I can say this, we have great leadership, both lay leaders and staff. There is a sense of warmth and openness in this church. People come here, I've heard it. I've heard them say this. They've come here and they've experienced the healing love of Christ. We have a great facility, old, aging, but a great facility right in the heart of Piedmont. So many of the signs of a fairly healthy church are here. It's a great place to be. But I think also it's a dangerous place to be. Dangerous because when things are well or things are pretty good, it's easy to become complacent. To become kind of self-satisfied. So easy to look around sometimes and think, wow, we're doing pretty well. We could probably cruise and just kind of take it easy. And that is why I think this word is exactly the word we need to hear today. Did you catch what Paul's exhortation is to this church that is doing so well? Did you hear what he encouraged them to do? so that they could become even more unified and stronger, so they could become all that God dreams for his church to become. Now think about this. Paul could have said so many things here. Develop more programs. Become more effective in your leadership and strategic planning or management. So many things Paul could have said. But Paul says something somewhat surprising, I think at least by human standards. He says, what is most important is your attitude. Make my joy complete, he says, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfishness or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves not just looking to your own interest, but putting the interests of others ahead of your own. You know, Paul is, it's kind of interesting here, Paul is grabbing a first century phrase that really means let others go ahead of you in line. It's kind of like, you know, a few weeks ago, honest, true story, I was at the Safeway in Rockridge, and I had one item and I ran up, I wanted to get in and out, I was going into the, to the uh, checking line, and here's somebody with a full basket of things. And they were just there a few seconds before me, cut in front of me, and there they were. Now, we would think they would see I had one item and would say, you go ahead. You have one item, I have this whole basket. Why don't you go ahead and take care of it? and I'll uh, wait for you to be done. No, they, they saw me, they knew what was going on, and they just scooted right in there. That is not the attitude Paul is talking about here. Paul is saying, oh, have the attitude that you would let the other person in line ahead of you. Be humble. Look to the interests of others ahead of yourself. Wow, this is what Paul suggests for them to become unified, for them to become all that God wants them to become by becoming more humble, by valuing others more than themselves, by looking out to the interests of others, by serving each other, and I believe by serving those outside the walls of the church. Now, why is this surprising to us? Because we don't think about humility much these days. It goes so counterculture in a society that's all about consumerism and having our needs met. God calls us to something very different. God calls us to give and to think about the needs of others. In a world that is really so completely and utterly absorbed with self, God calls us to be selfless. Bottom line, Paul tells the Philippians, if you want to experience 
all that God has for you, both as individuals, I believe, and as a church. Be humble. Have the attitude of Christ, and here's the key verse, in your relationships with one another. Have the same attitude of mind Christ Jesus had. Interesting word, that same attitude, phroneo, means life perspective, intellect, point of view, a way of looking at life. And says, Paul says, this is how we should see life. This is the lens through which we should see life. This selfless attitude, this service attitude. You got to wonder, why does God call us to be so different? Paul anticipates this question, and I think he's also asking, we would ask ourselves, why? Why would we do this? And Paul anticipates this question, and like a good preacher, he searches for a great illustration. An illustration that will touch the heart as well as the mind. He digs deep and he finds a great motivator, the greatest motivator, the example of Jesus Christ. And he says, this is why you should have that attitude, to take on the mindset of a servant, because this is what Jesus did for you, who was in the very nature God, did not consider God, equality with God, something to be used to his advantage, but rather made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant and being obedient even to death, on a cross. Paul wants to make it very clear that although Christ was equal with God, he was God. He was willing to give up his rights as God for our sake. Took on the form of a servant. The very Son of God made himself nothing, emptied himself. Wow, the king of kings became the slave of all. Though rich, Christ became poor. The one who is the giver of life allowed himself to be killed. Now, why would Jesus do this? Why would he leave the comfort of heaven to come into the pain and the brokenness of this world? Of course, this is the incarnation. Because God, by nature, is humble. God is a humble servant. The thought, and you know, I think this is the most amazing attribute of God to me. God is humble. More humble than any of us. This is beyond comprehension. God is humble and God is love. You want to see what God is like? Think of the night in which Jesus was betrayed. Remember the scene? It was so dramatic. Jesus took a basin of water and a towel, the tools of a servant, of a slave, and bent down on his knees. And one by one, he washed the dirty, the grimy, the dusty feet of each of his disciples, one by one. Many he would know would betray him just hours later. And then he said to them, and he says to us, now you as my followers do the same. Now you go and be a servant. You know, the good news here is that God never asks us to do anything that God hasn't already done for us. God asks us to love, but first he loves us. God asks us to be generous, but first, oh, He's so generous with us, God asks us to serve only after he has served us. So what does this have to do with us today for our church? Well, like I said before, the church in Philippi reminds me somewhat of this church. We're doing pretty well. And now we come to this time of transition. This time where we ask ask ourselves, 
What is God calling us to do next? We evaluate who we are. What is our mission? What do we want? Who do we want to be as we move forward? And it's so clear from this passage what's really important for us as we move forward is we must be united. We must be humble with one another. We must put the interests of others ahead of our own. We must have the same attitude of Christ. In this time of transition, I think we must ask ourselves, in this period of time in the history of the American church, when so many churches are declining, how do we thrive? Well, I think it's really right here. One of the keys is this attitude of humility toward one another within the church. But I think also our attitude of humility to those outside the church. And I think this can be post posited in a different way. I think when we're humble, we ask this question as a church, which I think is such an important question, and it's this. Who are we here for? Now, what are we here for is an important uh, question, and I think we have to ask that. What's our purpose? What's our mission? But who are we here for is a very important question. Are we here for ourselves? Just for the people already here? Because as we go through this evaluation, and if that's the only question we're asking, what do we want? What do we need? It's going to be very different than questions that might arise if we ask, who are we here for? Are we here just for ourselves? Or are we here for the world? Are we here for the people in our neighborhood? People in Piedmont and uh, Oakland and the surrounding area, Alameda. Who are we here for? People who are here already or just for ourselves? And how we answer that question has all kinds of ramifications. You know, I want to share a story with you. I was to close today. I was a pastor in Chico for 17 years at a church. We experienced tremendous growth at that time. It was a great time. God blessed us. It was fun. But about 10 years, 12 years into my time there, we looked around and we thought, wow, we're doing pretty well. I mean, all signs of health. But we looked around and we said, you know, we're getting older. <laughs> when I came there 12 years ago, influx of new young families, young people. And as we moved along, we just kind of aged. And all of a sudden, we looked around and we said, you know, we're a great group of people, but we're about 10, 12 years older than we were 10 or 12 years ago. And we're not bringing in younger people. We looked around, we said, you know, we're kind of missing a whole, a whole age group, 20s and 30s. They're here, but not the way they should be. We're missing out reaching to that generation and that demographic. And so we asked ourselves, how can we reach those folks? And what we did is we started a new service at an old theater and I mean an old theater, just a block away. Now, you got to know, this church is much like Piedmont, right downtown, as traditional as can be, as you look at Bidwell Presbyterian Church, founded by the founders of the city, founded in 1868. You look at the building, and you think, wow, that is a building of stability and tradition. And for the first time since 1868, we left the building and we started a service a block away in an old theater that had murals on the walls of fairies and all these other things. It's so different. Now, why do we do that? Because we asked ourselves, who are we here for? Are we here just for ourselves? Because if we're just here for ourselves, we love our worship. We love our old sanctuary. We love the beauty of our sanctuary. But you know what? Younger people are not coming here. And people who have never been churched walk up those stairs. It's intimidating. Can we 
offer them something that will be more accessible for them. With a music style, totally different, loud, <laughs> dark. We did that. Why? Because we wanted to serve. We wanted to love. We wanted to reach out to a gen generation that needed to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who are we here for? Now, I will say that it's great. We had people come to that service, never would have come into our sanctuary. We reached a whole new group of people. The service soon grew to 250, 300 people. Many who never would have walked inside the door of our sanctuary. Now, am I saying this is what Piedmont Community Church needs to do? No. I don't know. Different context, different time, different demographics. So many things are different. But here's what I want us to think about. I want us to think about this question. Who are we here for? As we go through this time of transition and evaluation, I think we have to ask that question. What do the people out there need? How can we meet, re, meet their needs and reach out to them as much as what do we need? Those of us who are, have been inside of this church, been part of this church for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Who are we here for? Have the same attitude of Christ. Serve. Be humble. Take the basin and the towel and serve the world. May it be so. Amen. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this church, for the great uh, witness it has been to this community for so many years. And Lord, as we come into this time of evaluation and transition, we ask that you would give us creativity, that you would give us hearts for the world around us. Give us humility in our relationships with each other, and in our relationship with those around us. So we may be a church that experiences all that you have for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, friends, as we go, may we as a church ponder this question. Who are we here for? Are we here for ourselves or are we here to serve the world? to serve those outside the walls of the church? Key question. And as we ask that, may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift his countenance upon us and give us all peace, both now and forever. Amen. <laughs>